and we will get underway. So hello everybody and good evening. Uh, it is March 12th. There is a big full moon out there tonight. This is Michael Watson and this is the IACT IMDHA presenter series giving you the opportunity to meet the presenters and to help you decide just what it is that you want to see and do at the Hypno Expo, uh, Hypno Expo 2017 that is, which is May 19th uh, to the 21st in beautiful Daytona Beach. And uh, there are of course pre and post conference programs on the days before and after that, which is what this, this series is all about. Uh, this is the ninth Sunday evening that we've gotten together out of a total of 17. So uh, do keep coming back. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with the great uh, presenters we have. And uh, we've got an exciting show tonight with uh, the dynamic Melissa Tears. Uh, we're gonna talk about working with addictions and uh, I'll introduce Melissa in just a couple minutes. But uh, we begin with the official announcements. So that you know, you are entitled to CEUs for spending an hour with us this evening and you collect an hour's worth of CEUs by going to either the IACT or the IMDHA website, whichever one it is that you are a member of. And when you log in with your member ID uh, and password, the screen comes up that gives you a place where you can enter the CEU. So just tell them that you are online for the presenter series and, uh, and that you want an hour. And uh, by the way, the program is being recorded. Uh, and if you listen to the recordings or the recordings of any that you might have missed so far, you can also collect CEUs for those. Uh, the recordings are posted tomorrow on the uh, IACT IMDHA forum. That is the Mind Matters forum. They're also posted on the website for either of those organizations. There's a tab up at the top of the page that says Media. And if you click on it, you'll see the Hypnocaster there. And it has all of the previous uh, programs that we have done. And under the Conference tab as well, you'll see Teleconferences. And the same thing, all of the previous recordings uh, are there also for you. Next week, we will be interviewing Dan Cleary. His topic is, say what? Communication is more than words we use. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, talking with and communicating with uh, Dan Cleary next Sunday night. And I might also just mention to you that the virtual chapter of I am I'm DHA meets on the second Tuesday of every month online. And uh, the next one will be Tuesday, the 14th of this month. So that's Tuesday of next week. And uh, I will be, actually, no, it's Tuesday of this, of this coming week, and I'll be talking to Will Wood about working with beliefs. So if you have an interest in working with beliefs, uh, dial in, same, same information that you used tonight. You can click on the same link that you used tonight uh, to attend that. It starts at the same time, 8 o'clock uh, login, uh, Florida time, that is, with an 8.15 start. So I can't stress enough what a wonderful selection of programs they're offering at the Expo this year, both before and after the teleconference. And of course, you can learn a lot at the conference itself in the lectures and the talks that are already all included in your conference registration. And you can even learn more in the hallways and through interacting with all the great folks that are always there. And in addition, the conference at gives the you beach. the opportunity. I'm sorry, and at the beach, that's exactly right. Um, <laughs> and at the pool. <laughs> and at the pool, yeah. And at the tiki bar and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in addition, the conference gives you the opportunity to add still more value by attending one or two of the pre and post conference offerings, which is what this series is about. Um, we'll be going on, uh, um, we'll be uh, going on for a while, but you might, uh, but you might uh, want to make your reservations uh, before you've heard all of the presenters in the series. So, do yourself a favor and just go on out to the website at hypnoexpo2017.com and you can check out all of the workshops to find the ones that will really help you take your practice to the next level. <clears throat> so, Melissa Tears, let me tell you about this lady. She is the founder of the Center for Integrative Hypnosis and a, uh, with a private hypnosis practice in New York City. She teaches classes in integrative hypnosis, neurolinguistic psychology, and mental health coaching. Uh, Melissa is an instructor for the NGH and the International Association of Counselors and Therapists and an adjunct faculty member of the New York Open Center uh, and Tri-State College of Acupuncture. Melissa is a two-time recipient of the International Medical and Dental Association's prestigious Pen and Quill Award for her books, Integrative Hypnosis, A Comprehensive Course in Change, and Keeping the Brain in Mind, Practical Neuroscience for Coaches, Therapists, and Hypnosis Practitioners, which was co-written with Sean Carson. 
Uh, by the way, she has another new one that's uh, uh, integrated hypnosis with uh, children, and uh, which she wrote with kids and uh, teens. Kids and teens. Yeah. Right. Which she wrote with Kelly Woods. With Kelly Woods. Yes, exactly. Um, all of these are available, by the way, at um, uh, Amazon, of course, but they're also available at the Hypno Expo from Melissa herself. So uh, uh, you can get them there. And Melissa was also awarded the NGH's 2014 President's Award for Excellence in the Field and the 2014 Speaker and Author of the Year from the Zurich Hypnos Congress. So uh, she's going to be teaching a one day course, Integrative Addiction Solutions, Rewiring Habits. Uh, on Friday, May 19th of the conference weekend. So that's a whole lot of stuff. I'm out of breath. So uh, welcome, <laughs> Melissa. It's, <laughs> it's, you could have just, just said, here's Melissa. I would have been more than happy with that. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm... You're on a roll, man. I wasn't going to stop. <laughs> I, I know. Well, I had all that, all that great stuff planned out to say, just to, just to make sure. So I, we're thrilled that you're on that you're here with us tonight, uh, Melissa, and uh, looking forward to uh, to talking about your program. And uh, gosh, I don't know exactly where to start, except clearly this is something that you saw a need for. Um, and maybe maybe a place to start would be uh, how did you how did you come into this in the first place? Well, um, wow, I can I can answer that in so many different ways. I know. Um, as someone who comes from rock and roll <laughs> prior to this career, um, I've, I've had a lot of experience both with addiction personally and, uh, you know, my surroundings and lost many people uh, to addiction. Um, so it's always been something kind of close to my heart. Um, over the years, I've been developing, uh, you know, my skill set and working with uh, different types of addictions and then starting to really simplify things down. So, you know, um, I used to think addiction was this very separate thing, you know, oh, what do we do for addictions? And, and where I'm at now is, is really a, a very different space in that I've, I've simplified so many of the issues that people come to us um, for. And, you know, addiction does have, uh, my addictions protocol has a few different levels, right? So the first level is, is, is a level that I kind of give to almost all of my clients, which is um, understanding that anything done with repetition, felt with repetition, thought with repetition creates a habituated pattern right? Habituated pattern in the brain and how do we change the brain? So the first level of my addictions protocol is really teaching um, people to segue very rapidly out of that uh, craving state as well as the state, the emotional state that tends to lead to the craving. So whether it's a compulsive kind of thing we're dealing with um, just an agitation, just a craving, uh, to be able to interrupt that pattern and then kind of, you know, learn how to reroute what the brain is doing. So the first layer is really to arm my clients with a skill set, right? They're given maybe five or six different techniques that will not only stop a craving, but stop the emotions that lead to them with this overview that each time they interrupt it, each time they stop it, they're helping to build new neural connections. So it's really about the self-directed neuroplasticity uh, level. So that's, that's the first one, Okay. right? Because one of the things, you know, in my experience uh, over the years, um, and I've really looked into this, I've studied, you know, addiction from many different angles, um, you know, the current uh, thing that they have addicts do, the current thing that's even mandated in this country um, is just in, on so many levels ass backwards. You mm -hmm. know, the first thing that, that you have to do in these programs is to say, I have no, no control, right? I'm powerless. And to me, 
and all of the research really, which is just absurd that, anyway, whatever. There, there's a, a, a program from the 50s, you know, that refuses to move forward with new research, with new understanding, with looking into the brain. You know, they have a disease model and the disease model is absolutely incorrect. You know, they're saying that this addiction, this is a disease and you can never get over it. That you can only, you know, contain it, manage it, right? Through total abstinence. But you have to first say, I am powerless. Then you have to, you know, um, give yourself over to God or God as you understand him. <laughs> and we won't even fucking go there uh, to that. But so there's so many layers that are counting. You don't need to be angry that God is a man. <laughs> no, you know, when I would debate uh, people uh, about this, when they would say to me uh, at a very young age, um, I had someone tell me that I would never uh, get straight um, unless I got on my knees and, and, and prayed to Jesus Christ. And when I pointed out that I was not religious and, you know, although um, being a good liberal Jew, I do appreciate Jesus as the good liberal Jew he was, but certainly this was not my thing. And it was just, there was no nowhere to go from that. You mm -hmm. know, it was, oh, well. And then I, of course, you know, being 20, went to the next person higher up. Yeah. You know, I want to speak to the manager, you know, I'm <laughs> in lockdown in some hospital. And then they try and say, well, okay, so it's God or it's God as you understand him. And so I wanted to kind of look a little deeper into what that meant. But anyway, that's a whole nother tangent. So yeah. you can see I have a little passion <laughs> sure, sure. when it comes to this. The, I mean, as hypnotists, we understand what it is to own an identity. And to constantly, through repetition, be, you know, reinforcing, reinstalling. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I am an addict, or I'm an alcoholic. Um, at a certain point, you know, if you're not drinking for 20 years, and yet you're still self-identifying as this alcoholic, you know, there's so many different negative hypnotic suggestions going on in the more traditional frames. Sure. Um, that being that you have to hit rock bottom. That if you have one drink, it's all downhill, right? Mm -hmm. So that that perpetuates this, you know, up and down. I mean, I had one drink, I'm fucked. I might as well just go for it. Rather than what research is really telling us, which is, you know, and please, if anyone is listening, and if you're getting a benefit out of a t traditional 12-step program, awesome. And take what is meaningful to you. And if it's working, keep working it. So when I have clients and they're in the program and it's working, then I am, it, me and their higher power are going to work together and we're going to get this done. So I don't go up against beliefs. But typically, if people come to me, that program hasn't worked. Right. Where it does work and where it is good is that it gives meaning, which is one of the key components meaning to people's lives. They have a group where they can share. And for some people that is vital, you know, to belong to that, to feel heard, to feel understood. We as human beings yearn for that, mm -hmm. you know? So where traditional treatment goes right is that. It's the community. It's some of the steps are really introspective and they're really good, just good soul searching. Um, I mean, some, not many, <laughs> in my opinion. But if it's working for them, awesome. Then I'm just going to teach them a skill set to make it easier, to make working it easier. So we have this standard treatment here in the U.S. and, you know, in, in many places that um, have just a, a few um, faulty, really faulty presuppositions inherent in the model. And so where we come in as, as hypnotists is to arm people, right, with power. We give them back the control in their lives. We, we give them responsibility, 
right? So that the first layer is to arm them. The second layer of the protocol is, is to go a little deeper. There is direct, uh, you know, there's a lot of research that connects early childhood trauma with whether or not you are, you know, one of the people that get more easily ensnared in addiction. And so the second layer is really to have all of the processes that help people to work through um, inner parts conflicts and just deep uh, emotional work. And so that's kind of where, you know, a lot of, of the techniques that we all use really come into play. We, we look at memory reconsolidation in the brain and what it tells us is that we can take these hurt memories and we can reconsolidate them with a very different emotion. You know, people can heal, they can get over it, right? So the second layer is to do the deeper work. There's that work and then there's the neutralizing of triggers, right? So I teach many different ways to kind of take old triggers and rewire the response, right? Some of it is just straight up stimulus response that we break, you know, and some has a, has a, a little uh, deeper level. And, and that would be the, the level two, as I'm, as I'm saying, there's a few levels. Level three is not just arming people. Uh, you know, first level is, here's all these techniques that are gonna get you out of the craving state, get you out of the unwanted state and rewire your kind of neural network around that. Mm -hmm. But the different processes that we foster in the third level is ones that, you know, have a, a deeper meaning. So motivational strategies, um, different ways of connecting to people, different ways of, you know, um, healing certain relationships and different ways of relating to people on a very different level. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're, if they're in some form of group, then we foster how you can, you know, keep your um, power and still get the benefit of the group. If not, then I'm, I'm a big one for, you know, um, tasking uh, my clients with things that will foster better social relationships. So, um, you know, about five minutes from my center in Manhattan is the open center. And the open center, where I also teach some classes, um, is a really loving kind of environment, and there's something for everybody there. It's a big holistic center. And you can drop in on any classes. And they have gatherings, they have meetings. So, you know, that if you're um, tentative, if you're, you're in recovery and you're just kind of sensitive that this is a good place for you. <laughs> you know, everyone is kind, everyone is open. So I have a tendency to do that, to, you know, lead people to, you know, dancing, to something that, you know, that has movement and a group. And so there's, there's a bunch of different things that I would do on the third level, depending on the individual. Sometimes journaling, you know, there was some interesting research that says that people that are, um, you know, different societies that have the least amount of, of addiction are societies that really do foster a, a cultural identity, you know, um, a ancestral, you know, deriving meaning from, you know, who you are and your place in the community. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really um, missing. We need more compassion and things like that in their lives. So there's all different ways that we, we would finesse that. You know, there's a lot of these old assumptions, um, like I said earlier about the disease model, uh, just not being true. You know, when people say, but the brain, you can look at the brain of an addict and it looks different. And I'm like, yes, as does everybody's brain when you, you know, the brain does take the shape of your experience. Sure. And so of course you're going to see it. Now there's not just one area. The thing about addiction is it's so compelling because it not just engages the, you know, the, um, the dopamine and the, the reward center and you know, all of that, but it really does engage the whole brain. You've got the planning, you've got the, 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 the motor, you know, the, the movement aspect, the motivational aspect, you've got, you know, the, the emotional 
cognitive, the whole brain is involved. And so it's, 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 a, it's a neural network that has many different areas in the brain. And, and we, we start to foster just uh, rerouting that and, and co-opting uh, more forgiving. <laughs> nice. We're giving things. So there's, you know, that's, I'm trying to take what is ultimately a, you know, two day thing and, and, and synthesize it down to, to, to just some of the, the levels. And, you know, one of the things that's cool about this protocol is it's so adaptable that if there's a <coughs> form of hypnosis that people are practicing, it, it all fits in, you know? I mean, the one cool thing about even learning um, what's brand new in, in, in memory reconsolidation is that whether you do NLP, you know, re-imprinting timeline or regression to cause or, you know, you're hitting the same basic elements that's needed to, you know, uh, reconsolidate that memory with a, with a new emotional component and emotional track. And so it's, it's really something that um, everyone can make use of. Um, right away. Nice. So, so when, when you say everybody can make use of it, I'm wondering, is there, is there any particular skill level involved here? Is it, is this, is it appropriate for people that are, you know, just starting out or is it people that are more advanced or what? It, are there you know, any requisites? It, it really is for, you know, for wherever you are in this. So people that come to take this training from me, they're everything from newbies you know, to therapists and coaches that really don't have much uh, hypnosis uh, training. Um, and then there's seasoned hypnotists that have been doing it for 40 years. So um, it's a way of, of you know, thinking uh, a little differently and, and, and doing things a little differently, I think, than what certainly what the current uh, models that are out there um, are doing and saying. I think it's it's really an empowering protocol, and there's so many different pieces. I tend to um, prefer to overgive so that you've got you know ten processes in your back pocket, even if you sure. only need three. You know, because sure. what I like to do with my students, and you know, I think you've you've, you've sat in and on my classes enough to to kind of know that I have a tendency to you know, want you to be armed with so many variations that you can relax and just pay attention to the client in front of you. Yeah. Knowing that you, in any given moment, have all of these different things you can do. Um, and then it's really about being present. You know, there's something about that, um, that relationship that is really important, especially for people that are, you know, overcoming addiction. But I should also say that at this point, and I, I started with, I've simplified things down a bit. I mean, to me, I think anxiety uh, is, a, is a habit. You know, I mm -hmm. think um, d depression on, on many levels is a habit. It's a habit of thought. It's a habit of feeling. It's a habit of belief even. And so even if you don't intend to work with this particular um, group of people, right? Addicts, alcoholics, please understand this protocol is really for any habituated pattern. Um, the, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to rewire any habit in the brain and the deeper processes are for anyone who's feeling pain, mm -hmm. um, trauma, you know, stress, things like that. Um, you know, the, the third level where I, I talk about motivation and, and moving forward, it's really about, I mean, everyone can use that. Right. You know, my anti-procrastination uh, protocol is in there too, because what starts to happen is, you know, that momentum forward has been thwarted, <laughs> you know, through the use of, of, of drugs, self-medicating and things like that. And, you know, there's a lot that... Um, society you know throws on top of people that are in in this system you know that that really doesn't uh, doesn't gel with with the current research you know i had uh, sorry i'm in my mind i'm thinking yeah. i had opened a few loops and i just want sure. to close them before we uh go into the q a yeah um, the other uh thing that i mentioned is you know what what some of the research is indicating you know a lot of people don't understand that um this old idea that if you, 
you know, what causes addiction is the drug. You know, it's like, right. oh, if you take, you know, cocaine, if you do cocaine, then you're just on the road to ruin. If you do this, if you do heroin, you're just gonna, no. Uh, 90% of uh, people that occasionally do cocaine or even heroin um, are not addicted. They, they do it socially. Um, mm. No one likes to talk about that. No yeah. one, especially hypnotists, don't like to talk about the fact that 97% of people that used to smoke and gave it up, 97% quit cold turkey. Yeah. <laughs> you know, without the patch, without the help of a hypnotist or a coach or a therapist. Yeah. Even me, even, even this hypnotist here. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so we've got all these different ideas and you really have to kind of um, <laughs> dehypnotize so many people because it's out there. People have yeah. these ideas that, you know, there's there's so many great books and even a good TED talk would be uh, if you go to ted.com and and uh, and look up chasing the scream you're gonna get uh, Johan's great like 18 minutes it's pure gold mm -hmm. and he really talks about some of the research done on you know what causes addiction and how all these misconceptions um, abound you know this this idea that if you do this drug you're you know you're weak and then you're always addicted you know he he says look if, if grandma goes in for an operation a hip operation and they're giving her like the you know the hardcore opiates um then you know by 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 their explanation of what causes addiction grandma would be coming out and she'd be you know a junkie yeah yeah sure. now yes of course that occasionally <laughs> happens <laughs> but it's not the norm you know the whole thing about the vietnam vets yeah know, that's what i was just going to mention is is that there's a whole lot of that that i understand that people that use yeah. use terror was it there was going to be an epidemic because of the vast amounts of heroin addicts uh in, in in vietnam the vietnam vets they were all doing heroin and they were starting to think oh my god they're going to come back we're going to have such a heroin problem but the truth is the majority of them um came back and and you know detoxed and and that was it you know and uh johan o'hara used a great uh metaphor you see because um the early experiments on addiction right that gave us these big strong you know metaphors that stick in our mind was the rat put in a cage and he was given here's water and yeah. here's cocaine and of course he did the blow until he died and it was like see they can't control themselves they they just go for it until they die and there was a rat park experiment where they said yeah. let's look at this and they instead of putting the rats in an isolated cage with nothing they put them there with other rats. They can be social and, you know, things to climb and food and sex and, you know, this, this park, rat park. And when faced with that, they rarely ever hit the drug. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, the thing about the Vietnam vets is when they came back, you know, they, they, they got out of that cage mm. and they came back to a home, right? And right. the ones that didn't, they brought the cage with them. Yeah. You know, and so it really is about meaning. You know, there's so many great people out there um, that are doing this work. Um, another good TED Talk would be uh, uh, Dr. Hart. Um, what the heck is his first name? God. Uh, he's fantastic. He wrote a book called um, High Price. And he did a lot of the, he's a neuroscientist. Um, fantastic. Just watch his video or read his book, better yet. The Biology of Desire is another fantastic book, another neuroscientist um, looking at, at, at deeper at addiction. Stanton Peel is another one who really does a lot of good work. And so there's, you know, it's really should be changing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But somehow it, it isn't. Somehow we've got this 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 holds you know the 12 step program just got in there without any science without any research it's really just this thing and it helps such a small percentage of people <laughs> that they really need to be they really need us 
you know, sure, sure. <laughs> they really need us. Now I'm, I'm trying to put together something um, uh, that's going to make its way into bigger rehab centers. And so I've got that in the works. Um, you know, I'm going to have a, a list of practitioners and if I have my way in the next year or so, this is going to be a much bigger program. So I'm trying to train right now. I, I'm training people in this protocol uh, next, uh, maybe in 10 days in Dubai. Um, you know, so I'm traveling a lot. I'll be doing, you know, uh, training people in, um, you know, Zurich and in London. And I just, the more I can spread this around, uh, the more practitioners are out there. Mm -hmm. If every practitioner, if I can get it so that we can get them into rehabs, get them into the outpatient and inpatient centers, then sure. seriously. Now, so that's, that's my hope. My hope is to really spread this around. And, you know, I'm, I'm a bit lazy by nature. <laughs> So I'm hoping that I'm going to train enough people that it's going to have, reach a tipping point. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, what, what, what I'm fascinated with is, first of all, I noticed that so much of the, the conversation that we've had so far um, is really about helping people that need help. And I, I, I appreciate that about you and about the way that you, you know, that you think about what you do. Uh, on the other hand, what we've got on the line here are practitioners themselves who may be looking for, uh, if I add this to my practice, what will that mean? And, and you know, as I do, that, uh, that all of us have different approaches and different ways of practicing. When, when you describe it as a protocol and you talk about levels of the protocol and, and things like that, I, I, I just want to get clear. This is, this is not like a one-shot deal, right? This is, uh, this is an ongoing thing. Or typically, how much time would you spend with a particular client Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm always very flexible in this. Um, you know, the, certainly I see people on average of three sessions, sometimes three to five. I have some people that, you know, it's more of a coaching kind of situation. They'll check in every few weeks. Um, I have some people, I've trained a lot of therapists. So, you know, they're seeing people ongoing every other week for even years, you know, that's the therapeutic model. And that has a, a great benefit as well. So the cool thing about this is there's so many different um, pieces to this, that you can spend a session just giving the pattern interrupts. And that's typically what I will do the first session, I'll give three or four techniques, and I'll teach them how, you know, it stops a craving, it stops the feelings, they're going to go away with that the first session. Okay. Second session, we do deeper work. We're looking at the wounds. We're looking at what, what has come up for them in the, in, in the week or, or whatever. I'm teaching everyone self-hypnosis. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the parts integration or three-step reframe, we're looking for a deeper insight. You know, a lot of people want to know this stuff. So the first layer, as I said, on some level is really about interrupting the pattern, rerouting the brain. But everyone is curious to know why they are the way they are. And that's where the deeper trance and the, you know, the, the generative trance states can come in as well. And I know that's a, a, a you know, a, a big um, baby of yours as well as this cultivating these states so that we understand what was the positive intention? What was your unconscious doing for you? You know, and they understand, they get a broader perspective on this. Right. Mm -hmm. So whether it's my version of the six step reframe, which I know, you know, is a three step reframe for me, <laughs> um, because this is New York, um, <laughs> you know, and, and people really do have that positive intention and, and they, they engage that part of them that says, you know what, you know, you're not, you're not bad. This isn't bad. You know, this was doing something for you. It was serving a purpose. And so we, we do the deeper work. I teach people how to access, you know, I do like a wise advocate kind of process so they can access and, and have, you know, um, almost a, a confidant, you know, that is their own wise advocate, their own inner guidance. If they are in AA or NA, then 
I take them into expanded awareness or ultra hide or any of these processes where they can kind of connect to that part of themselves. Sure. That gives them that overview, that broader perspective. Because that too, the research indicates, creates a sense of purpose and meaning, right? So we start to, there's so many different ways that you can, you know, with each session, be cultivating these, these different processes and states. So it's really about the individual and, and how you like to work with people. Nice. So that it's not my way or your way. It's all integrative, mm -hmm. you know, and like I said, if you have favorite processes, then they have a place in this protocol. You know what I mean? Right, right. Because most of the processes do a few things, right? They're going to either, um, you know, one of the ways to think of it in any given moment when we're working with someone, right? To simplify it even further, we are doing one of two things. We are either pumping up the resource or we're shrinking the problem. Because ultimately, we are collapsing these states, right? I mean, in the bigger picture of things, mm -hmm. it's almost all collapsing anchors. Yeah. But yeah. really, so any process you have, whether it's tapping or, you know, any of the pattern interrupts that people love, or whether it's the you know, the deeper, even going into trance and doing even direct suggestion creates a shift, a, a change in state from where we can start to uh, add in these pieces, yeah. add in the three-step reframe, add in the wise advocate. So, you know, it flows. Cool. Now, let me, let's give uh, people a chance to ask some questions. And I need to remind them, if you are on the, uh, if you're on the internet, if you're, uh, if you're watching us and, uh, and you're using a computer, <clears throat> you can ask your questions by opening up that participants box. Uh, it's to be found down at the bottom of your screen if you don't have it open already. And at the bottom of that box, there is an option that says raise hand. So if you click on that, we'll know you've got a question. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine, and uh, that will also let us know uh, that uh, you have a question because it raises a hand for you. And, uh, and then I can open up your mic, and you can uh, ask your question. So uh, feel free to do that. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have a question right here from, uh, from Andrea. And Andrea, I am unmuting you now. And go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Um, so when dealing with addictions, are there any emotional issues that you notice keep coming up? Um, just this, you know, I know that there's so many, but, but just similar, the same ones that you notice that seem to be key. Um, well, it, you know, that's a, it's a hard one because it really depends on, on the individual and, and, and you know, what, what, what their life is like. Typically by the time they would come to a hypnotist, they've yeah. kind of been through the ringer. So there's a lot of um, self uh, anger, um, shame, um, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy. Yeah. Um, okay. All of these things that, you know, that really we can say, uh, we can say there's certain initiating um, emotions and programs at play. And the initiating ones are the early childhood kind of experiences. And not always, but many times, um, these are things that are primed very early on, sense of, of, of safety. Um, and it's around uh, safety and uh, worth. But there's a whole other layer to this where the addiction itself is what starts to self-perpetuate more negative emotional states. So that so much of the negative emotions are surrounding the addiction itself and me as an addict, you know, and what that means and, 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 and the repercussions or the ramifications of their past behavior. So we've got kind of two layers. We've got the early childhood stuff that a lot of time comes into play. Um, I'm always reluctant to say this and this and this because it's not always true. There's a lot of people that come from 
you know, had great childhoods and, you know, were come from very loving families and then fall into, you know, this drug and the drug itself is compelling enough to start to drive the addiction. So there, there is a lot of that as well. Um, so that's why it depends on the individual. But some of the things by the time they get to us that we have to deal with is really the, um, you know, the anger, the anger at themselves. Okay. A lot of, and the shame. And that would be uh, the, the main ones, I think, that, that are big, that are real big, is, uh, you know, forgiveness of self comes into play a lot and acceptance of self. You know, and I think that's where a lot of the deeper trance processes that are meant for insight, um, the insight oriented processes really uh, provide a broader perspective and they can forgive themselves more easily. Does that yeah. help? Yeah, thank you. Right. And, and we've got another one. Uh, Blaine uh, has his hand up in the air. So uh, Blaine, welcome. Go ahead and ask your question. All right. Hi, Oh, hey, I see you, Blaine. Yeah, Looking good. I, I figured the whole camera thing out. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just so to, well, first, first of all, hello. Nice to see you all. Um, this is great. Um, I also am, I am going to be taking this class in Las Vegas, so I'm looking forward to that. So Excellent. I, I was curious about what, uh, what all it would entail, but just a couple quick questions. Um, one is, how much of the, the protocol is, is, uh, is the same or similar by session or by client. It's a protocol, so there's a structure, there's a, there's a regimen to it. And then how much of it would you say is more variable by client, by situation? And then the second part, rather than just me waiting, is it seems, it seems as I've thought about a lot of addiction and stuff, there's a ritual component to it. And I'm really interested in it's something I've read a lot about recently is this the, the ritual component and ritual in people's life, how it tends to give meaning and uh, purpose kind of behind some things, but I'm just curious if there's a, if there may be a role or some portion of the ritual aspect that, that can or should be not done away with, uh, because I think there's some, there's some good parts to that, but some way to, um, to address that as well. So there you go. You know, I, I love that you brought that up because um, there really is a heavy duty uh, ritualistic component, um, you know, and so we give them better rituals, <laughs> you know, um, depending on the individual and, and what they're going for. I mean, as I said, I teach everybody uh, self-hypnosis. Um, I teach so many different forms of self-hypnosis that are very ritualistic, um, you know, whether it's kind of the open focus brain stuff, whether it's the different ways of stimulating you know, the vagus nerve, whether it's the, you know, accessing inner states of, you know, uh, wisdom, insight, all of these create their own kind of rituals. And then there's the rituals in the greater community, right? So then there's the taking the class where you can, you know, socialize, you know, get out of the old patterns and into creating some new ones. Um, so I think there's something to be said for, for that that ritual. Oh, and, you know, one of the things that um, I didn't talk about is a lot of times when we talk about what does this do for you or what has this done for you in the past, um, you know, we get to hear a lot of the positive stuff that was coming out of the drug, at least initially. And so sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm not adverse to giving an anchor you know, a very ritualistic anchor that has some of the components of, of the ease with which they were feeling when they, you know, well, well, when I take uh, two uh, shots of tequila, I feel that sense of loose and I can talk to people and I feel comfortable in my skin. So I'm going to be like, okay, well, let's do it. And we get that state and we anchor it so that they can now kind of feel some of that comfort, that ease that they were searching for. And so that too can be ritualized. I think there's, we, we, we all have, have some need for ritual in our lives, you know? Um, now the first part of your question is, uh, you know, what is, you know, what, what is protocol kind of regimented and what is more fluid? I will say it's all kind of fluid. Some of the, the things that I find most 
more of, you know, a consistent uh, protocol that I give to clients would be the pattern interrupts, would be the, the self-directed neuroplasticity frame, which I know you've heard me uh, do. Um, that part is pretty consistent. Then it's about finding the pattern interrupts and the processes that work for them. So not everyone is going to do the tapping or the, you know, the va vagus nerve stimulating or the bilateral stimulation or, you know, like we go, I'm, I go fishing. What's the easiest? The consistent things are teaching people to shift into peripheral vision. You know, so, so the, the top tier is the one that would be the uh, more consistent with almost all people is they've got to have some way to segue out of very rapidly in unwanted state. My technique has to be faster than downing a shot. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how can I compete? with the immediacy, even of a chocolate bar, you know, like we can, we can widen this out. It doesn't just have to be about, you know, um, drugs and this, it could be any compulsive thing. It could be that, that food they overeat, that pattern they do that, that even nail biting, you know, I've got to create things that are as compelling and engaging and fast, right? They've got to be able to segue out of a state. And that's why that part is more consistent. As far as everything else, that flows with the individual. What form of ritualistic, self-hypnotic technique am I going to give them? Am I going to give them a space one? You know, the open focus brain one, the space between. Am I going to give them something more formulaic? Am I going to, you know what I mean? Are we going to create something? Um, I had a client, I, you know, I like to do different inductions every session with a client so that it's, you know, so that I'm engaging the, the novelty. I'm getting dopamine hits because it's new, right? The brain pays attention to novelty, right? So um, I did some kind of crazy induction that I was just making up as I went along and, and the client took that and then was created like a whole nother level to this induction that they created for themselves and came back and said, so here's what I've been doing. It was fascinating. <laughs> now I'm going to teach it to other people. <laughs> so did I answer you? Just, uh, yeah, absolutely. My daughter's yeah. sitting here with her food, and I, I have a strange feeling. Uh, it is the time. Zombies are about to come on. <laughs> it is time for the Night of the Living Dead. So, uh, by the way, Catherine also had a question, and, and uh, what I'm going to suggest is that uh, is there some way that people can contact you, Melissa? Yeah, um, absolutely. Sorry, hosting. <laughs> Um, you can email me at mmtiers at aol.com. Um, if you have uh, questions that I, I didn't uh, answer, um, Facebook, uh, you know, all sorts. If you go to the IACT IMDHA forum, um, you can call me. <laughs> Just go to my website. It's pretty easy. It's melissatears.com. And, uh, you know, shoot me an email, give me a call message me i'm ridiculously accessible between sure. my phone my ipad okay um, that's great so the time has flown by let let me just yeah sorry final. about that i didn't realize it, it's great just let me make a couple final announcements and then we'll all say goodbye to you uh just to remind everybody ceus are available go out to the website and uh, sign up for your ceus uh you can get the recording from tonight there as well Next week, we'll be talking to Dan Cleary about communication is more than the words we use. And on Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, I'll be talking to Will Wood on working with beliefs at the same time and that channel. Uh, and so, awesome hypnotists. Yes, he is indeed. And, and last but not least, uh, Hypno Expo 2017. So log into hypnoexpo2017.com, look at the catalog, register for the conference, select your pre or post conference programs to take advantage of these special opportunities to hey. learn from the best and then come and join us on daytona beach in may and what i'm going to do now is uh, here's what we always do melissa i'm just going to take everybody off of mute so there will be a great cacophony and amongst it people will be shouting goodbye we love you uh, and just how much <laughs> it, everything wonderful that we have done so so good night everybody and uh we'll uh, see you next time Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Bye-bye, Al. Say goodnight, Gracie. Good night. Say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Dan.